So this is um, going to be a presentation that I'm going to give in Haiti in three weeks. It, it turned out to be an article, so I've, I've cut quite a bit. Um, I'm going to talk as quickly but as clearly as I can so that we are not here for more than 40 minutes, okay? So that, that's my goal, and I'm just looking forward to your comments um, and questions. Okay. Um, from the time Atta came to visit this place as a shy child, she told herself, this is a place for adults. Atta's childhood impression of the island nation of Trinidad is comparison is a comparison to a prancy peacock with a perfume strutting that is desirable and memorable but cannot be trusted. Unya Kempendu's All Decent Animal begins with Atalanta's arrival in Pocaro Airport as a young adult. She has been back before in visits with her island father and continental mother, but her exact nationality is never revealed and then and therefore never fixed in the narrative. She is designed as an ideal transnational subject, moving between temporary class, national, racial, and even gender categories. Walking through customs, she describes Trinidad as a complicated process and the home of the greatest show on earth. It is common on both the socio-political situation as well as the festival season for which she has returned to apprentice for the carnival mass designer, Stringer, who is loosely based on Peter Minchal. Atta is a newcomer returnee who will stay for eight years to fall in love, to care for a friend living with AIDS, and to become a writer. Kempandu's third novel continues to unpack themes of diasporic imagination, disease, and social indictments, with her female protagonist harnessing the subversive power to shuttle between genders and sex to create carnival moments in the narrative. My project can find fet bodies as participants, voyeurs, and consumers of non-essentialist carnival. It is a rethinking of Boston's carnivalesque that resituates the vulgar and the grotesque as ongoing, not limited by the festival season or reason, and its satire directed outward and inward. The fet body is a double body, one body sanguinely engorged on symbols of the past and the other body dead so that they become unborn and therefore part of the past. Essential to this model of carnival is the work of utopian scholar Michael Gardner, whose analysis rescues Bakhtin's project from critics who overemphasize the simplicity of medieval carnival's unfettered utopian vision of orgiastic excess and transgressive license. Breaking into this totalizing view of the ruling class versus the popular is helpful for pulling out more interesting non-antagonistic relations that I believe are at the heart of contemporary carnival modes from written to the performed. I will be thinking through Kempandu's carnival moments using Bakhtin's carnivalesque as a mode of critical utopia. A critical utopia resists closure in nostalgia and in those traditional binaries that stage ideology and utopia as opposites. Instead, the carnival is about longings that align with the real and affective effects of diaspora. The unsettled feeling of diaspora, the feeling of missing something old and looking forward to points on the horizon make the utopian a model of carnival that is not a corrective measure to homeland politics or economic shortcomings, but a way for bodies, human and non-human, to rematerialize as different kinds of subjects. Diaspora, as Nadia Ellis writes in Territories of the Soul, queried belonging in the black diaspora, is best understood as a mode of feeling and belonging, one fundamentally shaped by the experience of loss. Bakhtin's, Gardner's, and Ellis's examinations of cardinal queerness and diaspora and literature chart and culture charts a path to Kamu Brathwaite's conceptualization of Caribbean cosmology, which in turn brings together Fanon's thoughts on black identification, Stuart Hall's positioning of diaspora affect and culture with vulgar and grotesque embodiments to be found in Adrian Piper's mythic being, Damiela El Titlumberica, and the 2011 post-earthquake Haitian defile Carnival. It may also be important to see how diaspora dragon disease were taken up by the promiscuous commingling of utopia and ideology in Kempandu's earlier novels, Bucks and Spice and Tide Running. These performances and theoretical juxtapositions help in reading Kempandu's playful tragedy. The fet bodies present in her novels are smeared in nationalist 
and masculinist dirt sticking to beautiful language. The carnival apparatus therefore tells us a great deal about the Caribbean's Euro, Afro, Indo, Sino, Luso, Hispano, Creole characteristics, how they exist simultaneously as and with such ripe irony, ambiguity, and beauty, and why, and in a very real sense, carnival logic explains the frustration with economic and political institutions in this region. Cultural and discontinu discontinuities in the Caribbean present themselves as an overlap of past, present, and future. For Bratwaite, carnival is one of the 12 cosmological designs that chart an alternative typology for island life, embodiment, and affect. Carnival is parallel with Wudon, and an ancestor is part of a larger celebration of birth, life, death, renewal, explosion of space, time, or tem, in the case of carnival, implosion of it, them, in the case of Wudon, the celebration of these things, survival, see also limbo, crop over, cultural and resistance victory, there are many names, nomo of carnival in the Caribbean, C, CFA. His poetic elaboration defines limbo as art of memory, transportation of the culture under duress. It is also linked to the Sycoraxian nature of poetry, prayer, history, information, where Sycorax, Caliban's mother, is a figure formally disreputable or forbidden, even ugly, and evil, old mass, carnival, but is celebrated for being both our departure from and arrival to living as outsiders. Sycorax is the original queen of band, whose name is a play on Psychorax, as in heartbreaker, or Sycorragia, as in death struggle. Her death struggle is passed down to her son Caliban, who passes it on eternal to the post-colonial protest novel. All decent animals tropes of the transmogrifying queen shifting from seductress, mother, son, toxin, fool, fruit, animal, reveler, masculine woman to a feminine man is the cultural overlay of a critical utopia. The movement is a transfusion between death struggle and desire. To begin, All Decent Animals is a story about the diaspora experience of a group of close-knit friends circulating between upper to working class. Atta arrives to work at Camp Swampy as an apprentice to the white trinity designer, god of design named Stringer, and he is king of mass an impetuous genius out of the wrong color and class in the world of black independence. This white Caribbean man has London classical actor training and all his appreciation of the cultural fabric that he grew up with in Trinidad. He returns home determined to recreate a costume identity the way ordinary people celebrate their body, their freedom, and ancestral genes. Slinger has won top prizes in past carnivals and performances that honor Caribbean folklore. Atta ends up staying longer and taking over the apartment of the raucous stage manager, Francisco, who moves to London with his aunt after an anti-gay attack in his neighborhood. It is four years later and Atta, and Atta now works at a marketing firm befriended by SC, or Small Clit, a character who first shows up in Kempandu's second novel, Tide Running. So she does this thing where there are a couple of characters that like overlap in some of her novels. Um, Thomas, the, um, the domestic help, overlaps in Tide Running and is also um, Atta's domestic um, help in um, All Decent Animals. Essie introduces Atta to a cadre of UN babies and intellects at a party hosted by Fraser, a well-to-do London-educated Trini architect. At this soiree, the narrator uses an array of animals to identify the characters. For example, Atta is a deer, observant, mistakenly timid, but a voracious eater. Frasier is a turtle, a closeted gay man, and architect. Pierre, Atta's lover, is a French expat working for WHO, World Health Organization. And at this party, he's on the hunt for her, so being described as a wolf and frog. Sammy, the working class cab driver, not present at Frasier's party, but connected to everyone, is likened to a rabbit. SC is a swan. The former president, Eric Williams, shows up in conversation as an ass. While animality proves a grotesque image of the body, this paper will remain focused on other carnivalesque logic found in the novel. One interesting mode of embodiment is the way the title of queen moves from the prettified queen of the band to Sammy calling his mother queen, Fraser's gastroenterologist being dubbed queen of saline for the amount of transfusion she administers, the passion fruit as queen of all fruits, Atta as a queen, then finally ending back on the queen of band as she transforms into Slinger's latest design of old mass. And mass is like M-A-S is short for masquerade. Just wanted to like, you know, okay. For four years, Atta and Pierre live together. Here the story shifts to its present. Time is not represented altogether linear in the novel. 
but a majority of the telling happens after her arrival as an apprentice. Atta regards the hustle and knivery of the scenery from her and Pierre's home. Over time, she has enjoyed the blessing of her suburban hilltop home, but now she compares it to the old photographs that preserve a false, innocent glimmer in this morning's soft view, while the terror and violence of unstoppable undergrowth continues forging new world progress and exotically dangerous new breeds. This moment connects to a conversation that an ill Fraser, so Fraser um, will be diagnosed HIV positive, he's the architect, and a Catholic priest, Father Barnett, will have when they talk about Trinidad's history of European conquest and racial mixing. Fraser speaks of Villas de Naples, the loss of El Dorado, a colonial history, and Spain's desire to find a third El Dorado. But after the initial glimmer of gold, Trinidad remained a backwater post, breeding disease, mixed blood and sin for a few hundred years. The juxtaposition of glimmer and breeding returns to emphasize the entwining of fantasy and grotesque. Both instances set up the past with nostalgia and desire to be immediately soiled by the future possibilities of disease, mixing, and sin. In a critical utopia, the past is not allowed to shine too brightly for too long. In order for it to survive, it must camouflage its discursive power, as in the case of Pierre's antique gold Rolex. The idea of a real gold Rolex on a white man's wrist bothered Atta, but she hadn't known it was a Rolex until she looked closely. Here, Atta is not only sur surveying Pierre's indulgence and his indulgence, but her own complicitness. The watch was old, understated, the type of wealth that Pierre liked and worked hard to acquire, something he associated with aristocracy and value and style, the substance of history, something she was not sure about, but was now exploring with him. Her disapproval does not end with ridicule, with a wish to associate with it. When the watch catches the sunlight, another moment of glimmer, he catches her looking at his arm and winks. The scene describes a new way that violence of unstoppable undergrowth continues forging new world progress and exotically dangerous new breeds. Campadu's carnivalesque logic of erecting intimacy into ideology suggests that dualism need not be antagonistic to be vexed. In cultural identity and diaspora, Stuart Hall observes two different ways of thinking about cultural identity and how discourse is placed in narratives of diaspora experience. First, he acknowledges the importance found in imaginative new forms of anti-colonial, anti-racist, and feminist creative work. He argues these representations have the ability to restore an imaginary fullness or plenitude to set against the broken rubric of histories of slavery and migration. This production of identity becomes a source of resistance that confronts the fragmented and pathological ways in which that experience has been reconstructed within dominant regimes of cinematic and visual representation in the West. Hall observes a related but different second position that points to difference and displacement in the unrecoverable past. He concludes that identity is not an essence, but a positioning. And it is only from this second position that we can properly understand the traumatic character of the colonial experience. Questions of directionality emerge when one thinks about an identity as a fluid position outside of an origin. This in-between feeling, neither one nor the other, moved her from island to island, from Europe to the Caribbean, without obligation to either, a non-belonger, unrooted in place and race and in herself, each island, each time, as she saw the secret to the land and the lying creases of the culture, she found out something about herself, unsettled things not to be proud of, detaching until she sometimes felt outside her body, but at the same time unretractably entwined in it all, a disappointed accomplice, locked in but able to share remarkable, particular treasures. Atta's perspective thoroughly underscores the in-betweenness of not only her experiences but Pierre's. When Pierre shows up to the story at Fraser's party, he's immediately marked as an outsider, a foreigner most people could spot a mile off. Local detection takes a real skill mastered by island vibe detectives who zoom in on clues between stranger and a foreigner, between visiting overseas families and returning expat tourists, or we can smell fresh meat. To sense foreignness and localness becomes affective markers of a person's position unmoored from geography, but stretched across a horizon. The narrator release reveals that despite Otz's detection of Pierre's foreignness, this does not make her a local because she has also been detected as a foreigner sometimes. In the narrative, Pierre's foreignness is the disappointed accomplice, 
to Atta's feeling outside her body. Their bi-directional displacement forges their relationship. She moves from her small apartment to a waterfront home in an upper middle class neighborhood where the hills cradle the suburb. For four years, when Pierre would look out at the Gulf of Faria and remark that the sea is still this morning, flat as a mill pond, it bothers her slightly because it is such a European des description for such a tropical scene. This moment recalls another aphasic metaphor of snow falling on the cane fields. Of the Anglophone Caribbean school system, Bratwick writes, we are more excited by their literary models, by the concepts of, say, Sherwood Forest and Robin Hood, than we are by Nanny of the Maroons, a name some of us didn't even know until a few years ago. Thus, in our writing and from our conjured images, children of the Caribbean are more in tune to falling snow than the force of hurricanes. As a result, he cites how Caribbean children attempt to transcend both natural and alien spaces by writing things as the snow was falling on the cane fields. Yet this moment is as much about Pierre's longing as it is Atta's unsettling. Pierre thinks about their trips to Europe and how she changes and becomes calmer like the old landscape. From the reverse position in Europe, when she eats food from gourmet restaurants serving gutsy, almost peasant food, she would articulate things about his birthplace in a way that woke a new loving and longing in him. Here we see how their entwined histories have real material and symbolic effects. Atta and Pierre simultaneously transgress and rebuild the aesthetic of the bourgeoisie. When Fraser begins dialysis, more visceral images of bodily and social corruption come into sharp focus. The talk of unstoppable growth now includes urine, blood, salt. Even Atta's and Pierre's fake honeymoon marks a grotesque moment when their differences were beginning to leak out. The grotesque surfaces, not as a protrusion, but as excess fluid. This recalls Bakhtin's reading of the giant Pantagruel, in which there is an interplay of images, urine, blood, seawater. All these images are put together to form the picture of a cosmic catastrophe, the disaster of the world by flood and fire. This episode is degraded and renewed in the absolute, in the absolute material of the lower bodily stratum. Frazier's leaking out from transfusions, vomit, and diarrhea are recorded in his last days as he ruminates in and out of fugue states. His mother, queen of denial, is met with indifference from Frazier's British lover, Alan. Frazier's confrontations and his friends and family are intimate, not public, and yet they perform a catastrophic and curative function. The trope of confession gets picked up during this latter half of the novel. The leaking out of inside knowledge gives the tone of confession the shock of vomit rather than the reveal of a whisper. The vulgar mode of language meets the grotesque of the leaking body that leeches its secrets. This, catas this catastrophic and curative dualism here is the inspiration for Stringer's new carnival design. His vision is to radically refashion his last carnival band performance to stage a menage a trois entitled Imagine. The old world marries the new, the conqueror and the virgin, and Trinity is receiving them, two cold continents, Europe and America, a tropical Eden between them, an island of festivity. The heteronormative king and queen of band is disrupted with the addition of Trinity as the third member to the royal order of mass band. In the rehearsal of this performance, the undulating bodies of the performers are the shiny bodies that glimmer. Stringer leaves the rehearsal exhausted, and we find out from the manager, he's HIV, isn't he? The narrator attributes his creativity to disease on the brain. In both Fraser's case and Stringer's case, the wildness of HIV replication, the unstoppable undergrowth, is embodied in two prominent designers. If one were to assign a ruling class to this narrative, they would occupy that, that position. Architecture and costume design are preoccupations of the backstory, setting up a tension between containment and expression. And yet they rule from the category of the folk for their ambitions to destroy suppressive ideologies, yet protest is intimate, not public. At the very heart and soul of cosmology is the transformative power to be able to explode, dynamo, after dying, to I am from its creative negative. This is Camu Bradley, that's not my fly poetry. The creative negative is a generative force in the cosmology. For Fraser, the creative negative allows, his, allows him to help Atta conjure, conjure her maleness. In one of his fugue states, he looks at Atta and says that she is not the man he expected to come. As the toxins and transfusions course in his body, he tells Atta about her Greek namesake and who, who, who was competing in trials alongside men. The transparent viral feeling stayed trapped in Atta on this day. 
In a later visit, Atta will confess that she believes sexuality is a pendulum. I believe everyone is born bisexual. And she goes on to cite Amazons, Tiresias, and Orpheus. Frazier talks about the terrifying power of women in carnival who are sparkling with desire. Frazier talks about the Olympian wrestling moves that remind him of Soka and dance hall whining. And so whining, you know, whining is like, you know, grinding is twerking, basically. But it's for reals, just not twerking. It's, it's a little bit tricky. But I'll demonstrate after. Um, it is like men on men action from behind, a primordial setting for desire. There's a show of physicality and genitals, almost Olympian-like. It also <coughs> reminds him of his schoolboy days in England. This moment of clarity tracks back to a quote he remembered that describes a man climbing out of bed, saturated with femininity, wanting to dive into cold water. This masculine feminine baptism foreshadows a later scene when Atta dives into the sea and has, has, um, has either real or imagined sex with her male muse. When she recalls this to her friends, they think she has been raped or is having an affair. But talk about the man disappearing and reappearing. I started writing, and it's almost as if he's in me. It is not that Frazier is designing Atta. It is just that he's designing the space for her to explore this possibility. And it can be implied that his creativity in death is due to his disease on the brain. The creative negative for Stringer is this defilement of the nationalist and masculine script of King and Queen of Band by bringing in the fertile and lush space of a male figuration of Trinity. It is interesting to note that as Stringer explains Trinity, he imbues it with stereotypical female adjectives associated with Mother Earth, but genders it with male pronouns. The creative negative of the Caribbean cosmology was seen in the 2011 Haitian defiled Carnival that featured revelers satirizing government and NGO aid in the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake that struck with a 7.0 magnitude. A certain if a carnival should be held, a scaled back defile was paraded through the ruins of Port-au-Prince with revelers draping themselves in US, French, and British flags. They carried mock coffins to symbolize 300,000 dead, 300,000 injured, and subsequent cholera outbreak. 1 million displaced, and $13 billion in international aid that had slow to no material effect. Former pop star Sweet Mickey won the Haitian vote in 2010 election, but by 2012, Michelle Martelli's corruption scandal became a focus of Haitian anger and satire. Here, one can bring design and corruption together to engage the experience of cosmic terror. Haiti's history of trauma and triumph the latter being subject to how and when black power is deployed and for whose benefit becomes a symbolic body, a grotesque utopian body built for post-colonial protest, but leaking biopower. Martelli resigns in 2016 and five years later, tourist centers renowned for carnival workshops are still in ruins. In addition to the realm of the grotesque and vulgar, the fet bodies of characters also demonstrate Bakhtin's carnival misalliance so that everything that is normally <clears throat> separated by difference become reunited. Cultural and racial hybridity is one of the misalliances that Kemper Du plays with in her novels to show the current and historic face of the Caribbean. In the case of all these and animals, the racialness of Trinidad shows up in the grotesque dismembering of Sammy's East Indian fiance by her father, who is unhappy with his daughter marrying a black man. Even worse, he's a black man of working class status. Kempandu's work relies less on boisterous carnival laughter as it does self-critique. Another misalliance in her work are her transnational female narratives who disrupt the repetition of gender performance by taking on male or gender neutral qualities. Gender misalliance is fluid and picks up on the historical role of drag in carnival. Across her three novels, Kempandu treats gender as a porous space to be occupied by any given permutation of child, adult, mother, man, woman, flora, or fauna. In her writing, changing how you occupy human space offers new possible social subjectivities where females' bodies can be comfortable in and out of costume. I see Campendu's carnivalesque logic in conversation and alongside the work of Adrienne Piper and Damiella El Tiet. Adrienne Piper is a philosopher, writer, and artist who in 1973 created an alter ego called the Mythic Being. By donning an Afro wig, mustache, sunglasses, and male attire, 
and by adopting male behavior conventionally identified as masculine, she recorded her sustained transformation into a working class man. She transformed conceptual art, conceptual art practices, infusing them with political and personal content. In Damiela Elkit's first book, Lumperica, the depiction of Chile's, of Chile's dictatorial national crisis is set in a public square where the titular character breaks curfew. The presence of this woman in a public space after dark in many short scenes is written in discursive passages of non-standard syntax. Her body and its language come to embody the resistance to Pinochet's crackdown on civil liberties. Lumberica complicates the representation of the body and its mental dispositions in the public square through animal transmogrification, utterances, and expert animal aptitude. By keeping her body enigmatic as animal, it resists articulation, except through her own syntax and words. It is through this hyper-defamiliarization that the body later renders and cuts itself in an effort to recompose itself. This opens up a world of imminent, of imminent resistance and consciousness. While Piper and Elkeith are in conversation with the rhetorical drag and the animality happening most noticeably in all decent animals, gender misalliance is also intrinsic in the carnivalesque logic of her earlier works. In Buxton Spice, prepubescent Lula imagines a fat Buxton Spice mango tree with its thick black and green arm growing outside her window knows too much. She imagines it as a panoptic of her world that sees all but refuses to tell her things all of the horrible dark road secrets, plotting and scheming. In contrast, but as effective, is Lula's own peephole surveillance of her world. Part one of the novel introduces the holes and wood knots and gaps in windows, floors, and walls that provide Lula and her three cohorts, Sammy, her sister, Judy Dabro, a neighbor, and Rachel Dabro, a neighbor, with the means to spy on their community. While these snatches of mostly sexual encounters provide the main source of many of Lula's vivid renderings of life in Tamarind Road, Guyana. The permanent dilemma for the author is she must make these erotic discoveries congruent to encounters with the political taint in 1970s Guyana of then President Burnham. By making Lula the mixed race child of a semi-radical Guyanese writer who along with his family have British passport, this heightens their otherness by privileging her with authorial, authorial conclusions, even though Lula's childlike hesitancies and imaginations exist. This means the slippage between authorial voice and character voice ruptures either the realism or trinity of Tamron Grove or the purity and coherence of fiction. And so I'm gonna cut out this one awesome scene where this old lady tells the president to kiss her stinking ass when he he insists that we're gonna be self-sufficient. You don't need detergent, use salt to wash your clothes. And so everyone's kind of smelling and she's like, kiss my ass. So it's a very like old school Bactinian like grotesque moment. Lula's witnessing and wording is surrealism. In a novel structured with contiguous stories rather than linear chapters following to a plot-driven terminal, there is an opportunity to explore Lula's voice as an amalgamation of subtle temporal shifts that juxtapose her inquit child self with her surfacing adult self. To this, add Lula's other coexisting selves, her man self and she self. Sitting back in the yellow van under the house, feeling things changing right here in ourselves, our sex parts growing, hot things running through your body, a new stubborn man self growing in me. The man self is characterized by confidence and curiosity. The she self is characterized by the quality of femininity each girl has at any given time to access or that is recognized by the male or maternal gaze. They each have a man self that takes turns playing the role of husband in order to hump each other when they play family. For Lula, her she-self is made self-conscious by the Bucks and Spice mango tree that spies on her. Her man-self responds to limits set forth by masculinist ideology, and when she embodies him, those are the moments when she takes the most sexual risk. Kempendu's second novel, Tide Runnin', is set in 1990, and there's, I'm skipping through a racial part as well, because one of the, um, the Dabro sisters are like light-skinned, Portuguese descent, and one of the daughters is having a relationship with like a dark-skinned black man, and so they're having sex, but the mother accuses her of being raped and like rips off her clothes and says, why is your vagina red? And it's like this entire vulgar grotesque moment where you see like her swollen vagina and the mother just continues like to abuse her um, verbally. Um, so, Kempendu's second novel, Tide Running, is set in 1990s Tobago. Tobago. 
immediately after carnival season in Trinidad. There's also a narrative told through considerations of the racialized systems experienced by its young protagonists. For Afro-Caribbean teenager Cliff in Tide Running, the carnival <coughs> fantasy begins with the arrival of a Caribbean woman, Bella, and her husband and her English husband, Cliff, to the small town of Plymouth on the island. The story embraces a, the complexity of the tempest only metaphorically that the tempest only metaphorically contemplates a menage a trois. Indeed, Bella Cliff and Peter can be read across history as post-colonial versions of Ariel, Miranda, Prospero, and Caliban. But the post-colonial trouble difference may be too reductive to explore the complex linguistic situations of this novel. This is a contemporary tale of consumerism, tourism, escapism, and cultural recuperation and appropriation by way of extramarital sex acts plus fetish. There's a lot going on in this story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip Young and the and Oprah Winfrey. Because Bella is a mixed-race Caribbean-born Brit, raised tr Trinidadian, who marries an English man, her language and her body exist in a liminal state. She's able to code switch between Caribbean, demotic, and a standardized English. She's able to engage in lengthy discussions with Peter, her oh wait, yes, Peter, her husband, and with Thomas, her Tobagan, Tobagan, is it Tobagan? Thank you, Tobagan housekeeper. I love having Jamaicans in the house. While code switching gives a sense of lingual fluctuation, it is a liminal language creating its own distinct register. It is an in-betweenness that opens past, present, and marks Bella's diaspora longing. This never closed feeling is elaborated in the chapter Lyman all the way. So Lyman is spelled L-I-M-I-N hyphen. Lyman all, all the time. And I'm not going to embarrass myself and do like the Caribbean patois because I'll embarrass myself and this is being recorded. What you are not seeing but hearing is a homophone. Words that share the same sound, the same, um, the same sound but have different meaning. To lime or liming in Trinidad and Tobago means to hang out. Lyman in psychological and physiological terms, is the smallest detectable sen stimulus or sensation. Oh, it's lemon or limon. Is it lemon or limon? I'm going to say limon. So that's L-I-M-E-N. In the chapter History Walking, Peter is feeling sensitive to his perceived diminished relevance in the trio. He comments, It's not the excitement. It's when you exclude me. You have some naive romance for his brutesy background or something. To this, Bella responds, What? because I can understand what Cliff's saying, because I can talk his language. Never even thought about it, so sharing a piece of identity with Cliff occurred to me as something that excluded Peter, a separate thing from love, sex, and friendship. Romance for roots my ass. Bella's spoken in conscious awareness of the space she shares with Cliff is a turning point in the book. It is something to look out for when the last chapters switch between speakers in a rapid fire and no longer separated by chapters, but bleed into each other. So this is another example of leaking. Because the boundary between language and action is never quite stable, the in-between feeling is bi-directional, with homophones tragically linking parallel stories with, lur with words like tide and tide, like tied me up and the tide of the ocean, lime and limen, even the homonyms Peter and Peter, like to Peter off, and then my husband's name is Peter, Cliff and Cliff, like being on the edge, and, and Cliff is actually on the edge as well. I'm, I, I didn't close read that here for you. The double bodies invite a deep linguistic reading of individual words because the Lyman in this novel provides a false shelter for its characters. Yet when it comes down to it, only Belle and Peter are equipped to exist there. In Tide Running, the treatment of domestic culture and penal authority is often frustrated by seduction and ineffective modes of control. Bella shows a wild side, whining on random party goers at a hotel bar, then is restored as an ideal maternal figure by giving Cliff the positive attention he misses at home. This contrast to Cliff's own mother, who is often out of the house looking for odd jobs. Shy Cliff is emboldened by the rules of the newcomer's bohemian lifestyle. He comes over uninvited, particularly for sex, half mocks Peter, an immature test of manliness, and then begins to steal from the couple. The lack of rules create a blurred collective consciousness, conscious shared by the three. It is at first utopian, black, white, and mixed race. It is pansexual. It is consensual and non-conflicting. But this lack of conflict or the openness of rules in Bella's bourgeois life is at the core of the problem in their different cultural positions. For Cliff, it is an important and alien experience, like snow falling on cane fields. How can a woman be both mother and lover to a man and a son? 
how can a husband allow his wife to sleep with another man without feeling challenged, even when he is being challenged? How can a young man filled with other people's discourse feel his own power? Puss Rebellion is an attack on the, on the Caribbean bourgeoisie and white male dominance, even as he dreams a Tupac gangster paradise. Though the couple is hesitant to take action against, against Cliff's smaller indiscretions, including coming over for sex uninvited, they do when he steals their car. And though enough people know about their sexual entanglement, class rules in Tobago disentangled Bella from Lane. Economics is incisive. Cliff's criminality is paired with Bella's naivete. Yet, without staging a chapter where Cliff ruminates over his decision to break in their house and steal their money and car, he just does and ends up in jail at the end. Kempandu's fictions and her narratives allow me to understand the experience the experience of carnival that is relevant to contemporary masqueraders. Not old mass, not pretty mass, but a dutty mass, which does a little of both. It is a dirt combination of damaging social indictment of officialdom and damaging cultural indictments of commercialism. To the point of commercialism, recent conversations, this is with my friend, I'm like, this is not a recent conversation, and, you know, just like, and reading, like, stuff, right? Recent conversations see the art of carnival fading as its costumes get imported from Chinese manufacturers. The shift to mass production may be a direct link to the number of Trinidadians in a foreign metropole whose persistent desire to return home or reconstruct home means that each year the carnival has to support a cultural mythology of homeland. By looking at the transnational subject through their diasporic experiences, moments of vulgarity are met with poignant ambiguity. This unsettling in Kempandu's work provides a poetic and political examination of the third world in general. In the FET body, I am conceptualizing carnival to be both vulgar and self-consciousness in how it catalyzes transgression so that when a body is both actively the spectacle and the witness to its objectification, it becomes the material intervention across various and even simultaneous representations of space. It is fitting along with the final, it is fitting that along with the final prayer, by Father McBarnett, he shares the story of a black slave who poisoned fellow slaves to get back at his master. He recalls, poisoning was a special form of revolt that outdid the master's whips and chains. Poisoned blood is in our veins, the Caribs, the Caribs before that. Frazier, unable to use his mouth to speak, thinks of another story, another history of corruption in an accounting of Sir Walter Riley and his men who were shot by poison arrows that made them thirsty but drinking would only make the condition worse. And in this moment, the longed for past, unsettled present, and limbo future merge as Atta writes the beginning at the end. Um, this is a, a quote by um, Paul that I thought was beautiful. If this paper seems preoccupied with the diaspora experience and its narratives of displacement, it is worth remembering that a discourse is placed and the heart has its own reasons.